All right, speaking of Ukraine, Ukrainian officials said today that a third round of negotiations ended without a breakthrough and only small progress on evacuation logistics. Meanwhile, Russia stepped up increasingly indiscriminate assaults on civilian targets and infrastructure, stoking fears that thousands of Ukrainians could die in the coming days unless something changes. Joining me now to talk about the latest developments in Ukraine is CBN senior international correspondent George Thomas, who is live in Ukraine. George, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much, Tony, for having me back on the show. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for staying up late. I know it's late there, local time. Can you tell us more about what came out of today's talks? Uh, yeah, absolutely nothing. I mean, again, the, uh, the, the Kremlin comes to Zelensky and says, uh, you need to disarm, you need to uh, stop uh, uh, allowing weapons from uh, NATO countries from pouring in. You need to stop uh, uh, international foreign uh, fighters coming into the country. The reports are uh, close to about 140,000 Ukrainians, uh, mostly men, have uh, poured across the uh, Slovenia, the Hungarian, the, uh, uh, the, the Polish borders in the last 12 days. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Ukrainian embassy in Washington, D.C., Tony said uh, close to about 3,000 uh, Americans have signed up uh, and, and are, uh, on, are either here or are on their way uh, to Ukraine as part of uh, uh, the initiative by the Zelensky administration to allow foreign uh, fighters to come into into the country and uh, stand shoulder to shoulder with their Ukrainian uh, with their Ukrainian counterparts. So, um, look, the, the, we we have twelve days into this uh, invasion, and uh, Russia is losing this war. Uh, I mean, they had uh, envisioned uh, within a few uh, hours, twenty four to forty eight hours that they would lay siege uh, to Kyiv, the capital city, uh, that they would take uh, a good chunk of the eastern part of the country, uh, take the southern part of the country, uh, take the northeastern quadrant of the country. And uh, today, uh, almost three, two and a half weeks into this uh, invasion, they, uh, they are stuck, literally stuck in the mud uh, in, uh, in the northern parts of, uh, of Kyiv. So, George, let me ask you this question. As you have these uh, foreign, uh, and, and they're heavily being screened, so these are legitimate uh, individuals with skills and training that can help the Ukrainian forces, uh, is there sufficient material to uh, equip them when they arrive there in Ukraine? Uh, yes. There, I mean, look, since uh, the, the last eight years, uh, since uh, Russia invaded back in 2014 in the eastern part of the country, uh, the Ukraine of uh, 2014 is very different from the Ukraine of uh, 2022. Uh, I mean, they've gotten a lot more weapons uh, in the last eight years. They've beefed up uh, their their ability to defend themselves and go on the offensive. Uh, the New York Times reporting that the uh, the U.S. has uh, given them close to about seventeen thousand uh, anti tank uh, missiles. The Pentagon uh, reporting uh, releasing information that as early as last December uh, they were sending in uh, the kinds of weapons needed for Ukrainians to wage uh, uh, potentially uh, an urban warfare uh, in this country. You know, this weekend, uh, Tony, I had a chance to go to an undisclosed location uh, for, uh, away from Lviv uh, to get a sense of what was going on outside of Lviv. And, uh, you know, I took a number of major uh, roads and along those major roads, uh, you know, there are these uh, offshoots to different small little villages uh, uh, throughout the, this part of the country. And every single one of those um, uh, turns, either to the left or to the right, uh, was, uh, the, you know, they had uh, put up sand, sandbags, they had erected uh, concrete slabs. And at each one, I mean, I saw dozens of them. At each one of them, there were civilians uh, who were armed, many of them armed with AK-47s and other weapons. Uh, but uh, the, the sense, and in fact, coming into Lviv, coming from the outside, coming into the city, there are major, major checkpoints, uh, choke points necessarily ringing the, the city, and they are heavily uh, barricaded. Uh, you've got to go zigzag uh, through them. There are people that are checking your ID to see if you 
uh, you know, A, you're, you're a resident of the city. Why you are coming to the city? If you're not a resident of the city, uh, they are building structures. They're digging trenches. Uh, look, this is a city that is very far away, you know, about six hours by train from the capital city. Kiev has not seen any action uh, to speak of, uh, apart from, for example, the, 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 the missile strike on the uh, airport, the civilian airport, about five hours, four and a half hours south of us uh, in um, uh, Vesnati. Uh, but apart from that, uh, we haven't seen any action yet. It is a city that is tantamount to a city on, on a war footing, and they are not right. taking any chances uh, whatsoever. Uh, George, the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights has confirmed uh, 406 civilians killed in Ukraine since uh, Russian uh, President Vladimir Putin's invasion began. Another 800 uh, plus were, of civilians were injured as of midnight Sunday, according to the office, noting that fighting has stymied accurate reporting and the numbers are actually higher. What have you been hearing there on the ground from your sources? Yeah, absolutely. Because you see, I mean, I have I have a colleague uh, uh, who made a daring trip to Erpin uh, in the last 24 hours to rescue her son. Uh, you've seen the images. Uh, Erpin sits just about northwest of uh, Kiev, and they uh, Erpin is to the northwest. Uh, Sumi is to the northeast, and uh, they have been shelling uh, these two cities. Uh, incredibly for the last 24, 48 hours. And it's just been unbelievable. Uh, they're not going after military structures. Uh, and you're talking high rise apartment uh, complexes. They're going after hospitals. They're going after churches. They're going after schools. Uh, you know, we're not talking about the Gaza Strip. I was in the Gaza Strip when, when, when uh, 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 Hamas was using uh, civilian structures, hospitals, schools, mosques. Uh, they were using civilians as shields. Uh, this is not the same situation here. There is absolutely no evidence that Ukrainian soldiers are hiding in churches, are hiding in hospitals, are hiding in schools, are hiding in high-rise apartment buildings. Absolutely no evidence to, to, uh, to this. So uh, the question that the uh, International Criminal Court is asking is, wh why is Russia, are the attacks against these civilian structures tantamount to war crimes? Uh, Prime Minister uh, of UK, uh, Boris Johnson, says in his mind there is no doubt uh, that uh, Vladimir Putin is, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, is, an, is in essence charged with, uh, with war crimes. He's accusing him of committing war crimes by going after uh, these structures. I think my sense here, Tony, is that you see a desperation uh, on the part of the Kremlin. They have made no significant advances. Okay, look, they, they have the, the northern part of Kiev surrounded. Uh, they have Kherson in the south, a very strategic city. They have encircled uh, Mariupol, another very strategic city. They haven't taken the city uh, as of right now. Uh, they're continuing their advances, uh, attempts at advancing in the eastern part of the country. But the Ukrainians are putting up a very, very stiff fight. And in places yeah. where, which is actually remarkable, in places where, like, for example, in Kherson and Mariupol, where they are surrounded, and in some cases they've taken over, like, for example, in Kherson, thousands of Ukrainians are coming out and confronting these Russian soldiers waving the Ukrainian blue and yellow flag in the face of these Russian soldiers. I mean, it's incredible. Talk about defiance. Uh, again, well, the and sense I think that you it, cannot subjugate us. It, it, Sorry, and it starts clearly, well, it starts clearly at the top. President Zelensky has shown uh, tremendous courage and boldness in the face of this invasion. Final question, we're almost out of time, George. Yeah. I do thank you for joining us. But one of the reasons sure. we like to come to you is because you understand not only what's happening there on the ground in terms of the military, but spiritually, uh, the well-being of the church. This weekend, churches met. Give us a sense of what's happening in the church there in Ukraine. Yeah, they are. But talk about uh, Tony. Talk about being the hands and feet of Jesus. They have churches have uh, basically turned every square inch of their uh, of their structure into a shelter uh, of Christian homes. 
people are opening up their homes, uh, churches, hospitals, um, rather uh, offices uh, uh, and restaurants. Uh, people are just opening up their homes to complete strangers. I did a story just a few days ago on a young 22-year-old girl who lives in this tiny Christian, Ukrainian Christian, lives in a tiny, tiny apartment with her brother. And she invited five complete strangers who had, been, who had fled from Kiev. And they're staying with her. Her mother has about 24 people in her home. Uh, this is the spirit of Ukraine. Uh, the sense that in the middle of fighting a battle, they're also opening their homes and being the hands of Jesus. And, uh, to and those that's the need. church. That's the role of the church. George Thomas, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. We pray for your safety as well as our brothers and sisters throughout you, Ukraine. I appreciate it.